Welcome to the Brick by Brick podcast, where we take you from the ground up on all things real estate. I'm your host, Ben Shelley. We are fortunate to have Ryan and John back with us today. Last episode, we discussed general contractors, managing expectations, construction pricing, permits, licenses, and much, much more. Feel free to listen back. I would actually encourage it before diving in with us today. For today's conversation, I want to start by talking about how you approach the construction process depending on your individual project goals. So we talked in previous episodes about flipping properties as an example, where you may be looking to simply move on from your property rather quickly to gain equity so you can continue to invest in a neighborhood versus maybe buying something to rent and hold to create ancillary income on the side for you, whether or not you are a primary investor in a real estate market or a part-time investor. So I want to bring our experts in and, and have this conversation for me, who is obviously just starting in the business. What I'm curious to know, and we'll start specifically. So let's look at, for example, a flip example. How would you guys approach the construction process holistically, as well as your relationship with a general contractor with such a specific scope, like, like flipping a home in a real estate market in mind? Well, when it comes to a flip, the first thing that I would baseline my, my project goals against is what the neighborhood will bear. So if I'm in a, an entry level neighborhood where you're mostly looking at starter homes and, you know, in our area, this may be in the three, four hundred thousand dollar price range. I'm going to have a very different set of fixtures and finishes and fixtures in mind for a property like that versus in a higher end market around here when you get into the million plus price range. There's only so much that any market will bear and it doesn't make sense to over improve. When it comes to the dynamic with the contractor, that is going to in part depend on their level of expertise. So if you're bringing in a builder who has um, a lifetime of experience in the high-end space and really has a good eye for design, and that's part of what he's built the foundation of his business upon, then it makes sense to leverage that and to hear his opinions and to take a little bit of guidance from him. However, if you're working with somebody who is really just there to kind of take direction from you, then it is incumbent on you to know which direction you want to go and where you want to draw the line as far as finishes and, and whatnot. And, and that's really where knowing the comps and knowing the market is going to come into play. So maybe, John, what, what kind of finishes uh, and what kind of uh, things would you look for? Maybe I think most people would look at a flip and say, probably not going to do luxury finishes for something like that because you're looking to turn it over rather quickly and, and probably bring it up to its highest possible ARV within a certain range, given your, your, uh, your circumstance, uh, your financial circumstances. Uh, so maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you would seek for from pricing perspective and also uh, quality of material perspective. I think it really depends, as Ryan alluded to before, with the market and where the market is. I, I, the overarching thing for me that is most important about a flip is time. Uh, I, time is important in like, any real estate project, but for a flip, time is really, really money because you're carrying costs. If you're using hard money or you're loaning money, whatever, your carrying costs for the property can be very high. So every day or week or whatever that goes by is like actual dollar amounts. It has like an actual amount that you can ascribe to. So whatever it is that you do, I, I don't think there's, it's probably hard to say a general statement about like you should use this type of finish or use this type of whatever, but whatever you do, I would say be very, very cognizant about the time element. And even if you can get a general contractor lined up before you start or have a general contractor come in with you when you're looking at the property, give a quote, give an estimate, even that, could save you a week that a week could be a thousand dollars in a in a flip and that's significant money so my takeaway for finishes or whatever it might be for flip is focus on the time element because i you know it, the way i think about it too is and ryan mentioned this before about you know okay if you want something like a luxury finish whether it's a flip or not you want to find people who have expertise and whatever it is that you're looking for and also to, to john's point to be cognizant of your own timeline what your cost basis is and and what your financing situation is like you said hard money you really got to get moving on that timeline in terms of engaging again though with the gc in the context of your project goals for a rental for example i mean you guys have had experience both as general contractors yourselves and working with general contractors in both types of properties, John, maybe more so with rentals, Ryan, maybe more so with flips. So maybe talking a little bit more, I'd be interested to know at least a little bit more about some of your overarching experiences uh, working with contractors, given your different and varying project goals. I mean, a lot of times for rentals, I, you know, it really depends on the property, but I, I've tried really hard not to over improve rentals because I rent a lot of properties in lower income areas. And the phrase that I always use, and my wife likes to use this a lot too, is cheap and cheerful. So the idea is that you want to make it look appealing and nice, but you don't want to spend a lot of money on it. And you want to be considered that there are going to be tenants living there. And so 
in most neighborhoods, I mean, maybe the exception of very high-end neighborhoods, a tenant is not going to treat your apartment in the same way that you as the owner would treat it. So you're looking for durable materials. You know, one question is something I always ask myself in a rental is, you know, say, say I decide to put quartz countertops in a kitchen as opposed to granite or as opposed to, you know, a non-stone countertop at all. The question that I have is, am I going to rent this apartment for more money because I put this thing in? And oftentimes the answer is no. There certainly are scenarios where you could say, yeah, having a quartz countertop will get me more rent or give me a different caliber of tenant. But many times nobody cares and they're not going to pay more money for it. That's particularly true in lower income areas. Like the finishes, you want to be functional and nice, but nobody's going to pay you more money to have a nicer finish in it. So... The other question to ask yourself is, Is there are there going to be any other ancillary benefits to having that specific type of finish? So there are plenty of areas where you'll go and you know it, it may not even be common to have a kitchen backsplash. But if you have a kitchen backsplash, that wall is going to consist of tile as opposed to uh, just being painted. And when you have grease splattering from a fireplace or water splashing from the sink, that's going to be going up against your wall, your sheetrock as opposed to going up against tile. So when it comes to... I just paint it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't need that. That, that is certainly He's not joking, there, there are ways, gentlemen. No, I mean... It's, but, there, there are ways around it, but I, re- really what it comes down to is not, not, just, the, not just the cost up front, but yeah. the ongoing cost both in, time, in terms of money and time. Well, I think it's important to know too that... that when we talk about uh, uh, less expensive doesn't necessarily always mean less functional, right? I think there's a d- difference between function and, and quality in that generally there's a wide spectrum of, of functional finishes you can use at lower cost yeah. ranges. I think the word is value. You want yeah. to get good value. Well, value so, add, right? It's the name of the right, game. Of right, it's, it's no different than looking at a piece of property and saying, what is the best bang for the buck on this project yeah. or on this property? How do I approach it? I, I think you approach every renovation question the same way. Yeah. So now I'm going to take this in a little bit different direction for for people, again, like me, who maybe have already had some of these experiences just getting into the business with, with general contractors, which is sometimes this feeling that regardless of what stage you are in your project and regardless of what kind of project you're doing, it kind of feels like your general contractor almost abandons you at time. I think, obviously, these guys are oftentimes working and gals are working on multiple projects at once. But I guess I want to know from you guys, who are general contractors. Take us behind the scenes and tell us maybe why that is, why you felt that way. I mean, for me, right, I've actually been reaching out to a GC the last two days who we've done good work with and have not necessarily heard back from him and always on a timely schedule, but I know that he's on it. So how do you fight that as an investor and know when to push and when to hold back? Well, the first thing is whether they're giving you a reason for their silence. If they are just not answering your questions for the sake of ducking you because they don't have answers, then that's a red flag. If they are working behind the scenes and they have told you that, you know, plans are in with the city and they're ready for inspections. They are just waiting to hear back on a date. That's one thing. That's that's to a large extent out of their control. But if they are just ducking you entirely, then then that's a big problem. Yeah, I think maybe we can, I don't know if you're, you're going to touch on this specifically, Ben, but talk about the process because that has a lot to do with timing. So there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes with a construction job that isn't obvious to an owner. And a lot of that involves other components besides just like guys there with materials installing them in your house. So, you know, one component is the permitting process. So I, and, and, and even to, to step back from that, everything has a prerequisite, right? So you can say like, well, in order for me to redo my main sewer line, what does that involve? Well, it involves maybe getting the materials and say, okay, well, what materials do I need? Well, then you have to go and measure to see, you know, how, how much of whatever material that you want. Well, to measure, you might need to rip down a wall or you might need to do something else. And that might involve getting a permit or maybe even getting a architectural drawing if you're going to rearrange something or do something pretty substantial So or structural. So every, every sort of prerequisite kind of lines up and all of those things take time. So if you're starting and saying, hey, I need to get architectural drawings, that might itself take a week because you need to schedule somebody to get out there. They need to look at the property. They need to make an assessment, then get back to actually do the drawings. Fine. Then I need to go and get permits. Well, that could take, uh, just filing the permits itself could take a week because I need to coordinate with the subcontractor. I need to do whatever. I need to coordinate all sorts of crap. Then besides getting the permits, I need to actually maybe schedule time to do the work. That could be another half week, week because you know the guy's busy or I can't get the materials there on time, whatever, whatever. So it's very easy to see how these things can spiral into a month-long project, even if the actual construction work takes two days. 
And I guess it's worth noting too that a lot of the, a lot of the things you do, right? We talked about permitting, it and you're exactly right. We were going right to the the timing for the construction process. It's so important to keep in mind that there are other factors also outside just the people who are working for you. For example, getting permits from the city can be an ongoing process where you could be left in the dark, and usually are left in the dark up until the point they call you to tell you that things are accepted. Once things are finalized and 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 put in, and I guess another part, like you said, uh, uh, John, is pull, uh, contractors pulling permits and inputting them for you. I think investors often can do that on their own, but you know, as a someone who's maybe just investing in a home for themselves, oftentimes they'll leave that responsibility to the GC. Also, during the process, scheduling takes time. Oftentimes, uh, a task like that that is rather specialized is not going to be done by your general contractor, more than likely. It is going to be subbed out to a plumber uh, and oftentimes someone with that specific expertise. So not everyone is available at the drop of a hat. Sometimes it takes you know a week or so before a guy has an open day in his schedule, and that oftentimes needs to line up with the plans or with the ex- excavator schedule or with whatever other pieces of the puzzle are required on that day. So if you miss one day... Or if the plans aren't ready for that day or the the city inspector has to cancel, then that may push things back a week, not necessarily because that guy's not ready, but because A, B, and C don't all line up on on another day for another week. Yeah, I'll give a real-life example of we're working on several projects right now, mostly for our own investing that we're also doing the construction work on. And a lot of it is kind of like ready, set, wait, because we'll go to a building, we'll, you know, the first step for our projects is we'll, we'll demo it. So we'll demo the building and then we kind of have to figure out, well, what do we want to do with it? So we bring in an architect or a drafter to draft the whole thing. That alone could take, I think in our case, it's taken, what, two weeks for that to happen. So we'll wait two weeks for that to happen. Then during that two weeks, basically nothing can happen because we're waiting our subcontractors, like our plumber and our electrician and our HVAC person, is waiting for us to get the drawings. So we just have to wait. So we get the drawings, and then we have to give them to the subcontractors. They have to look at it. They ask us questions. We tell them what we want. That itself is a back and forth because they have to physically go to the property or do whatever else. So we're waiting for that. Then at some point, we say, okay, we finalized this. Now we need to get permits in. Well, now we need to get everybody to get you know signatures in the permits, get uh, insurance information, license information, get that, then submit them to the city. And, you know, technically we're supposed to wait until the permits are granted to begin actual work. And that could be three plus weeks for it to happen. So there's a lot of delays and say we then do the work, right? I'm thinking of another project that's a little bit further on. We have the permits, we've done the work. Now we're waiting to get essentially our rough inspections. We can't do anything else until we've passed our rough inspections, which are sort of like the first inspections that happen in the construction process. We have walls that are open. We have new plumbing, new electrical in, but we're just waiting for the city to come and look at it. And if they tell us that there's something wrong, we have to go back, fix it, and then call them again. So there's lots of start and stop, start and stop processes that go on. And to be clear with that, it's not that we don't want to be doing work. It's that the rough inspections require the walls and everything to be open. So anything that would be a logical next step, whether it's sheetrock, flooring, painting, cabinets, any of that type of finish work is literally impossible for us to tackle right now because we can't do that until we've passed rough inspections and rough inspections require that all of that stuff still be undone. Right. I mean, like I would say a daily task, this is one of your tasks, Ben, is to call one of our contractors to say, hey, can we get a quote? Can we get the number? Can you sign the permit? Can we submit the permit? That's every day. So it's not like we're or, sitting on our the hands. Permits, yeah, or are the permits ready? Or calling the city right. to, to are the permits say, ready? Hey, so where, it, it's like, it's we? not like we're just sitting twiddling our thumbs. It's like every day we're like, let's go, 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 go. But we just can't. There's just no way to do it faster without, you know, massively violating the law or creating safety liabilities. And I guess it's important to note that while, you know, it's going to sound like it's just a grand defense of, of general contractors, obviously there's good and bad in every business, that th- this conversation about timing is vitally important to remember for these reasons, that that there are actual tangible outside forces that oftentimes cause uh, the the reality that you're experiencing of either uh, perceived delays or real delays. Yeah, and, and these projects, I mean, we're, we're the most incentivized because the projects that I'm talking about right now are our own investment projects. We're also the contractor on it, but these are, this is our own money. So we couldn't be more incentivized to, to get it done. And even we are waiting weeks for stuff to happen. So. And the contractors want to get paid, obviously. No, of course. But I mean, e- even if you're cynical about it, we have the most incentive to do it and we, we, we can't do it any faster than what we're doing it. So you as a client, if you're looking at it working as a contractor, just because nothing's happening doesn't mean 
they're sitting in their hands. So, so what do, what, to what extent, I understand that, that it's really the contractor's responsibility for the most part, but to what extent for me as an investor, should I be involved in quote unquote passing inspection? As in, obviously I'm not doing the actual work. I shouldn't be the expert here, but is maybe there a level that, uh, that we could advise or give advice to, to the everyday investor for what they should or should not know or what questions to ask about passing inspections? I don't think the investor or the homeowner should be involved really at all in that capacity. That is ultimately on the on the contractor and on the subcontractors. But the homeowner or investor should have certain levels of expectations based upon the scope of the work. If if the contractor originally relayed that something would be a potential hindrance when it came to inspection time, or on the other side of the spectrum, if they said that something was going to be easy breezy, no problem, that should be taken into account. But it's not necessarily their responsibility to ensure that the inspections are passed. It is on the contractor's shoulders. Having said that, they should also keep in mind that there may be decisions that you as the investor make that will make inspections more difficult to pass down the line. And I think that's it's extremely helpful to to keep that in mind. Um, again, in terms of the, the the overarching context of how you approach your project, what you should and should not know. I have here a note that is probably not the friendliest of topics, but I think is worth visiting. Maybe it'll give some brevity. It's something that a lot of people go through, which is the idea. Of, even though you're, you're hiring a general contractor, you also could be in situations where you feel the need to fire. Maybe these outstanding circumstances that we've discussed. Maybe there is something insidious going on, or for whatever reason, they're just not meeting your expectations. It doesn't have to necessarily be a, how do you fire a general contractor, but what do you go, what, what is the process and how do you remediate situations with GCs that you're unhappy with? How have you guys done it? It's a complicated issue. There are a lot of moving parts. There's the financial part. There's the actual construction part. There's the legality part. There's the city permitting part. I have had to fire contractors before. And the one time I did, I ended up losing a fair amount of money that I'm actively trying to get back, to be frank. I had a contractor who came in, this is before we had started our contracting company, who came in and wanted to, and we, we'd hired him to get renovated an entire apartment. And after maybe two or three months of him doing truly nothing, I mean, this is not like him calling waiting on permits. We actually had the permits already when we hired him because we had used a previous contractor that we didn't pay any money, but had, it's a long story that's irrelevant to your question, but we- um, I do want to hear it though, <clears throat> off well, mic. <laughs> So we had this guy, um, he started doing work. We paid him a large deposit. I think we paid him maybe 14, 15 grand. And he did maybe nothing. I mean, I, I would say maybe he did two or $3,000 of work. And so he said, look, it's not going to work out. Um, no hard feelings, but can we have you know $12,000 back because we valued his work at that? And he said, no, basically. And so our financial options, so you know, at that point, there's a decision tree. It's like, well, I could continue using this guy because he's not going to give me my money back. But at this point, we probably burned every bridge because we said we're going to fire you. So probably not very incentive to help us. Got nothing left to lose. Right, not very incentive to help us. The second is, how can I get my money back? And I can touch on, we can both touch on how that might be possible. And the third is, how do I actually get the work done? So we ended up hiring another contractor. And you know, from a from a logistical point of view, the problem with a lot of subcontracts is that when you bring in a new a new contractor, say a new plumber, and the plumber's the plumbing is like twenty percent done. The new plumber is going to come in and say, "Well, I didn't do the twenty percent. I need to redo it because I can't put my name behind it." That's not uncommon because oftentimes licenses are at play, liabilities at play for these guys, and if, if there's something wrong, they could be held at fault because it's their name on the on the job. So the reality is that even the three thousand dollars of work this guy did, I had to redo, and for frankly more cost because I had to bring in an electrician and a plumber who just told me that all of his work was crap, which I, I, I frankly don't think is correct, but there's just no other option. I just had to go with them. They had to redo it. So I can go more in detail about how I'm trying to get money back from country and how you could. I do want to hear this. I'd love to hear first Ryan's perspective on, many, on maybe a situation where you did the same. I think you mentioned in previous episodes, a very bad experience with some of the very first contractors and general contractor and subcontractors you worked with. And I do think it's an important thing to note, which we'll discuss in a second, that right there's an opportunity cost associated with trying to get your money back when this process happens. That's really important, I think, for people to understand that even if John ends up getting his his money back, there's also the the time waste as well as the amount of money he's spending to proceed the, to, to try to get the money back maybe through right. legal legal means. So the actual formalities of changing contractors, as far as I've seen, are, are pretty simple. Uh, it's pretty straightforward for the instance that I will delve into in a moment, 
it was as simple as filling out a change of contractor form with the building department and essentially transferring the permit over well, to the new. You say that that's simple, but it's not, it can, it cannot be that simple because sometimes you need to have the sign off of the previous contractor. That, that, that's something I was worried about. And it was not, at least in this I, instance, I, it was not an- I've had the opposite experience. Yeah. All right. Well, caveat Fantastic. everything I just said. This is why we're in this game, <laughs> gentlemen. I think this has helped. I mean, this is, but it's important to realize it's amazing. Two, two guys who are extremely experienced in the business and in different sectors of the business have had completely diametrically opposite experiences with this process of, of cha- we won't say fire, of changing general contractors, especially in this climate with a lot of people out of work. Uh, hashtag furlough. No politics. Ryan, please continue though. So you 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 wrote off the change yeah, um, so, with the city and there was no problem. The the general contractor signed off on it. Right. Well, the previous one did not, but the new one did. And that was all that was re- required from the city's uh, point of view. The issue with it for me was more so the emotional to- toll of doing that. I mean, I, I remember at the time I was, I think, 25 or something like that. And I was working on my first big project with a contractor who was twice my age, whose life's work had been general construction. And I had to get him on the phone and tell him, look, you're done. This isn't working out. And obviously I wanted to- You're approach- done. <laughs> you're done. <laughs> you're done. So obviously I wanted to approach it in a delicate manner because as John alluded to earlier, there are logistical ramifications of doing this in a way that can be construed as hostile. Uh, And then they can make your life a little bit more difficult. So I was trying to be cognizant of that and I was trying to approach it delicately so as to smooth over the process a little bit. I remember the toll being quite strong on me, like weighing on me for a while before I actually pulled the trigger because at the end of the day, I was still new and I didn't really have the right set of expectations and I didn't really know what the baseline should be. I didn't know how a good general contractor operated. So the fact that months had gone by with virtually no work, with still no permits, with virtually no updates and very little communication, I didn't realize that that was so out of line and so off base, especially for a guy who tried to profess his professionalism. But ultimately, it was the only way I was going to get that project done. And obviously, there were costs to doing that. I actually, I think, just took the route of, hey, whatever whatever costs I've sunk into this, I'm going to chalk up to a learning experience and not take the time and not take the headache to to try to recoup. Also, perhaps in part because I'm not an attorney. <laughs> no, it's a great point, though, about what is standard. What is the baseline or expectation? A lot of a lot of times you don't know that. And it takes a lot of learning and knowledge and also personal fortitude and confidence to say, this is not acceptable to me. Even if this may be the standard, I don't find this acceptable. And from a tactical standpoint, I also had spoken individually with both the plumber and the electrician, and I had not really had any issues with them to that point. So at that time, I confirmed that they would be willing to remain on board without the GC, and they were. So that was one thing that I did to kind of mitigate the spillover effect that John alluded to earlier about having to bring in a new electrician, a new plumber. There were plenty of other issues with these guys, and ultimately, there's a lot of to glean from who one associate, associates themselves with, and these guys were obviously associated with that general contractor, but... And it's important to remember, again, that there's tangible costs there, right? Th- those were not reasonable waiting times given the process that where you already were, I think, in the process and you have holding costs to think about. So obviously... That's why like networking and, and knowing people in the industry is so important because if you literally know no one else is that, ever, that has ever done a gut renovation project with a general contractor, you have no basis to say whether something is taking a long time or not. But if you can call up your friend and say, hey, how long did it take you to do your whatever it is that you did? And he says, oh, it took me two weeks and you're, you know, in two months then obviously that's unreasonable. So last thing I'll say is it's also, it can be dangerous to work with someone who knows just enough that they can get by with these things. Most general contractors who operate in this capacity still have some level of experience and can still say enough things to kind of keep you at bay for a little while. So it's on you to be diligent. It's on you to be a little bit proactive and to at least know what's going on as close to the sources as you can, whether that's, you know, if the contractor says permits are in or permit applications are in, we're just waiting to hear back from the city. I don't want to say circumvent your contractor and, you know, make him look bad, but do it and call the building department and see if the permits went in the day he said they went in or if it's been, or if he said they went in January 1st and it's February 15th, then you call the building department and find out that they weren't submitted until January 29th, then that's a red flag. Did that happen? 
Maybe. <laughs> or like Ryan said, talk to the <laughs> sub, specific. <laughs> talk to the subcontractors yeah. and yeah, just yeah. say like, how's right, it going? What's going on? Yeah. Right. So John, do you want to quickly talk about on the bad side, what, what you're doing to try to, to, to uh, get your money back for this process? Yeah, Probably I'll, would be helpful. Well, yeah. I'll leave this to John, it, Eric. At I mean, it, it prefigures, you know, as I would say to anyone, and we, I think touched on this in the previous episode, when you have a relationship with a contractor, have a contract with your contractor. And the contract should specify things like what happens when, if things go sour. And also it should specify things like, here are conditions that would justify me letting you go. For example, if you're super, super, super late, if we have deadlines that are not met for some reason, that could be a justifiable reason for letting you go. And then, you know, in some agreements, there are specific clauses that say, if we terminate at this point, this is how much we will get paid or not get paid. With the one contractor that I had in question, we had essentially drafted it where he just gets a deposit up front and then he had subsequent payments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we had specific dates in the contract to say, if you don't, if haven't done anything by this date, then we can let you go. And he hadn't met, not only had he not met that date, he had met like two months after it. So our remedy is to say, I'm going to sue you for breach of contract because we had an agreement with you and that's a legal process, but that's, that's what we're doing. What are the chances that you recoup any or all of that? They're low. They're low. <laughs> but and it's, then, it's the principle. They're low. And, and, and that's the problem is because a lot of times, you know, particularly when you're working for people that are going to do work for less money, they might not have a lot of assets or liquidity. So you, you could kind of go down the rabbit hole and attempt to litigate. And I'm not, you know, a- advocating that you should or shouldn't. It depends on the money and your circumstances. But, you know, the reality is that there is a reason why contractors are priced differently. And one of the reasons is that a higher price contractor might have things like sufficient insurance or might have things like solvency, where if something goes wrong, you can actually expect that you might be able to get money out of them. And you can think of it almost as an insurance payment. So like I'm, I'm paying more money for somebody. Yeah. But in return, I have at least the possibility that if something goes wrong, I can, I can be okay. Is the reason that you don't think you will get anything out of this because there are no assets to, to seize or to get payment off of, or is it because the, the legal process by which you would obtain that is too cumbersome? It's both. I think that there are a few assets that are obtainable. I think that the, the way that this guy has structured his business, many assets will not be reachable in a normal sort of lawsuit. And and I think the, the flip side is that the time and effort and frankly money, because even though I'm a lawyer, I'm not going to show up in court to sue this guy, frankly. It's not, not worth my effort. Even the, the time and effort and all that to do it is, is going to be too much. So... And um, I, I think what's interesting too is is that uh, again you see all the different ways that these these scenarios can play out, and and I think it's it's important to note that if you are experiencing maybe delays in timing or perceived delays, communicate, uh, manage your expectations, make sure to understand your both your your recourse personally per your contract as well as your future legal. Uh, uh, means of recourse if you're unhappy with with a contractor. And then fundamentally, you know, a lot of this stuff, I think you just learn as you go through through the process itself. You got to try, you got to do it before you understand sure. where you need to be in the business and For who sure. you need to be networking with. I want to just take us through the end here. Uh, we, we Let's say we've, we're at the process, part of the process where we've gotten through inspection. Take us through to the end, uh, all the way up to the point where we need to pay our contractor. Ryan, why don't you take us through it? So after the rough inspection, everything that's done will be to get you to final inspection and ultimately to get you through the punch list. So again, based on your payment schedule, certain payment may be due at the conclusion of final inspections and upon receipt of the CO, and payment may also be due based upon completion of the punch list. Mm. And CO being certificate of occupancy, certificate of just occupancy, case, yeah. or depending on the depending on the municipality. They so may so have we a talk, we talked about. I mean, we t- just talked about some of the legal recourse you can take. But just g- generically speaking, the the end of the project is there. Maybe certain things aren't met in the punch list, and and obviously, as Ryan uh, alluded to, the more specific, the better. But what can you do? Maybe both if some of the work isn't done, and maybe there's a dispute, or maybe more importantly, if you don't like some of the work. I mean, how do you approach that uh, conversation in respects maybe to payment? You know, a, a lot of times contractors. The way that payments are scheduled is that there's a there's a larger payment at the end for completion of work. And a lot of times, you know, there's language or there's an understanding that the completion of work is based either on the original scope or on your satisfaction with the work. So if you're not satisfied with the work, there is a perception that you can go in and say, hey, look, I don't like this. Can you make it whole? If it gets down to having a dispute or you think the contractor says, hey, I've done everything that I'm supposed to do or the work is of sufficient quality where you can't be complaining anymore, that that gets into could get into some dicey territory. I mean, there are 
things that contractors can do. So, so the most powerful or damaging thing a contractor can do for, say, non-payment is to obtain a lien against your property, like a mechanics lien. And that's a, a, a legal concept. But the idea is that the contractor has you know, an interest in your property, can file an interest in your property that needs to be paid off by you upon sale of the property. And hypothetically, could even be foreclosed on by the contractor for non-payment. So that's sort of the most, I would say, powerful tool in the the arsenal of a contractor. And I think the exact means that that happens are maybe beyond the scope of this conversation. But if you have a dispute with your contractor, realize that that could be a possibility. This also comes back to the importance of documentation. So you'll have a much stronger case for fighting with your contractor and getting whatever it is that you want done, done, if you can go back to a specific contract or a specific point in the contract or to your original scope of work and say, hey, we specified that we were using 12 by 24 inch porcelain tile in the kitchens and in the bathrooms that we renovated. You provided 12 by 12 ceramic. And all I'm asking is that you make right by what our original agreement was or something that is like clearly discernible by the scope of work. Yeah, I have a a specific example that we're possibly going to be dealing with. We have a project where we're running we're switching the orientation of a shower. So there used to be a shower that was kind of like in the middle of a bathroom and now it's going to be on an external wall of the bathroom. And we were a little bit concerned that by running water lines through an exterior wall of the bathroom, the city might give us trouble because those lines are subject to freezing because they're they're literally on an exterior wall of the bathroom. So in anticipation of this, we texted our subcontractor, a plumber, and said, hey, is it a problem that we're running water lines in an exterior wall. And he said, no, it shouldn't be a problem as long as it's insulated. So if it becomes a problem, if the city says, hey, you can't do that, then what we're going to do is say, hey, remember that text that we sent you and you said it wasn't a problem, so you need to fix it. If we didn't if we didn't have that text very easily, and not that I don't trust this guy, but I'm just saying very easily, he, he could have said, well, we'll fix it, but it's going to be five grand because we have to rerun the water lines. So it, that's the importance of having you know, we are lucky because we we knew that going in, into it, but it's really important to have those conversations and have that set up because now we can look back at the documentation and say, remember the text December 18th, we talked about it? Okay, well. And that's why it definitely is important to harp back on that, on this consistent theme that we've talked about, again, managing expectations and communication and why that can be so valuable as you come to the conclusion of your construction process in whatever project uh, you may be dealing with. So guys, to end this conversation about uh, not only the, the ending of the construction process itself, but payment of your contractors, I want to ask you guys about financing options. Um, I think it's important for people to realize that there are different options and different ways to structure your payment scale and your payment structure with your individual contractors. So guys, maybe you can talk about either scenarios where you did this yourself or just options that you know about for individual investors. Well, the financing side of this is somewhat broad. There are a few different ways to approach it. There is financing pertaining to the investment itself. There are also specific financing options that are available to owner occupants, like the 203k loan program through FHA. And then there's also contractor specific financing, which is, I would say, a little less prevalent, particularly in this in this space, and probably won't apply to a bigger full-scale renovation, but there are ways to finance or there are contractors who offer financing through a variety of other platforms that would allow you to finance a specific project. Guys, I really appreciate your time and expertise as always. For the folks listening at home, make sure you subscribe to us wherever you get your podcast to reach out to us on the Brick by Brick, that's Brick X Brick Facebook, and make sure to listen to us on iTunes and Spotify. Thanks again, gentlemen.